I'm grateful to be in the Lord's house today and get to share with you uh, on this holiday weekend uh, what God, I believe, is saying to us and uh, His blessings that He wants to bestow upon us. And uh, as we uh, kind of go through this morning, um, I want to share a few thoughts first before we turn to some scripture about uh, July 4th weekend that we're in in the holiday weekend. And a lot of times we get to, we kind of miss kind of what really it's all about. Uh, we all enjoy hot dogs and hamburgers and cookouts, right? We all enjoy swimming and uh, firework shows and the big boom, all those type of things. And uh, But July 4th is um, about a country that was founded, rooted, and established in Christian principles. And there are so many today that want to rewrite history and remove those facts from the beginning as we look. Um, I want to remind you of a few of the words of our founding fathers before we read some scripture, uh, one of which you may recognize, Patrick Henry. Uh, He says this, It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ, end quote. Also, uh, George Washington, you may know that name as well. He said these words, Do not let anyone claim tribute of American patriotism if they attempt to remove religion from politics. Also, uh, Thomas Jefferson, you may know that name as well. He said these words, he said, The First Amendment has created a wall of separation between church and state. But that wall is a one-directional wall. It keeps the government from running the church, but it makes sure that Christian principles will always stay in government. End quote. Also, you may have heard of John Adams before. He said these words, We have no government armed with the power capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to to the government of any other, John Adams. So despite what uh, you may see uh, or hear from modern politicians or uh, contemporary media or what I would call the history revisionist, uh, America was not founded on the freedom to worship any god, Buddha or Allah, but really on the freedom to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where it began. And when you think about the foundation of our country, uh, the United States, we have such a rich history. And I can see God's hand all the way from the very beginning. So I was thinking today, since it's July 4th weekend, knowing that we have such a rich heritage as a country and how we were founded I thought, wonder what God would say today to America if he were going to have an audible voice and say some words. And uh, that's where I want you to turn with me to uh, Proverbs chapter 14 and be looking at one verse, uh, verse 34. And I, I entitled this message, God's Message to America Today, and I would say 2023. What would God say to us today if he could audibly speak If he were going to audibly speak, what would he say unto us? So I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we honor the truth by our standing. Um, We know God's word is true. It's life-changing. And this is what the scripture says. You can follow on the screen if you don't have a copy with you. It says these words, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. Um, Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for this country that you have blessed us by allowing us to be born into. Lord, we are so, so blessed. We have so many things we take for granted that the rest of the world desires every day. And Lord, I pray that as we walk through this text, as we look at these just nine short words, I pray you'd help us to focus like a laser and understand what it means and what you're saying to us today. I pray that you would hide me behind the cross and no one would see me, but they would see Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name that we have gathered. 
the one who suffered, the one who bled, the one who died, the one who rose again that third day, and the one we look for to return. Lord, speak and help us, Lord, to hear. And not to just hear, but to apply. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, when you look at the history of the world that we live in, it is littered with echoes of countries that used to be failed nations. There is Nineveh. I'm sure we've heard of that in the book of uh, uh, Jonah. There's the Egyptian dynasty we read about in history. There's Greece and also the Roman Empire. Once great lands, great nations, but now it's just an echo or a whisper of what they used to be or don't even exist. And I want to say this to you. If we as God's, uh, we as Americans, if we do not heed God's warning, we will go down the same step to oblivion. God is not to be trifled with. He is not to be uh, spurned. He's not to be held at arm's length distance. He is to be embraced. He is to be acknowledged as God Almighty, and He is to be followed. That's what the Scripture teaches us. And so as we look at these uh, nine words... Uh, just keep your Bibles open. We'll look through these uh, kind of word at a time. Now, the first word I want you to notice is, notice the word righteousness. It says, righteousness exalts a nation. Now, that word, uh, we, the word righteousness, we don't hear very often. We don't hear it from politicians. We don't hear it from anybody in Hollywood or in the media. We don't hear that word righteousness. And you don't hear it a lot in many churches, righteousness because I believe the word righteousness, what that determines is, that determines there, got, there has to be somewhere a supreme authority that determines what is righteous and what is not. And uh, there is such a thing as righteousness, and uh, as we understand that, that means there is someone who is sovereign. And mankind, we have such a varied uh, idea on what is righteous and what is unrighteous. However, God is sovereign authority. He is Lord of the universe, and He is the authority on righteousness. Now, on the screen, I'll have a, a Psalms uh, 71 on there. It says these words, talking to God, Your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. You have done great things. Who is like you, God? Truly, we can say that. Who's like God? No one is like Him. But also, as we look there in Psalms 98, it says these words, The Lord has made His salvation known and revealed His righteousness to the nations. So, my friends, the word righteous means there is one who is in authority, who determines what is right and what is wrong. But also, righteousness implies there is a very high standard. Society today... I don't think the society we live in wants a standard. Uh, they don't want to acknowledge that there is a standard that does exist. And the question you were to go ask somewhere, well, what is truth? You would get all kinds of answers of what truth really is. And, uh, but the word truth is so subjective today about what really is truth. And this, you'll hear these, this, these, this expressed maybe, uh, what's true for you may not be true for me. And what's true for me may not be true for you. That's the way the world wants to live today here in America. But I want to say something to you. I want to declare it. God's truth, His Word is truth. It doesn't matter what the world may say, what you may think, or what the world may... It doesn't matter. God's Word is truth. That's where we must stand. And I believe that's why the Bible has been attacked from the very beginning because they don't want to acknowledge that there is an absolute authority, that there is truth. There is a standard by which we are to live. I want to read to you a, a passage uh, there in uh, Psalms... Uh, let's see... Uh, Psalms 119, excuse me, 119 verse 40, it says these words, How long, how I long for your principles in your righteousness preserve my life. And then as you look in Psalms 119 verse 142, it says, Your righteousness is as everlasting and your law is true. At the founding of our nation, the Bible was held in high esteem, and uh, you don't get that much from uh, history books today, but you can go visit the website wallbuilders.com, and you'll find a treasure tre chest 
of nuggets of gold about our founding as a country and our founding fathers and what they said in the context in which they said them. And uh, it's one thing to admit there's a standard. It's also something another, quite another thing to take that standard as your own. So as we take God's standard and we stand in the world that we live in, in the world that's uh, uh, from God's estimation, we know that uh, the world is getting worse by the day. Uh, the world, as the, the Scripture says, is fallen, and it's getting more wicked and further away from God as the, from the fall, the results of the fall getting further and further from God. As we take God's standard and stand on it, we're going to cause some attention and we're going to catch some heat. Just get in the public realm today and make some comments about uh, things that the world embraces so much. I pray every day that God's uh, uh, view, and that we would treasure God's view of life and relationships. That we would honor His principles and we would stand upon those. But you mentioned anything about life and relationships and who defines what a relationship is, you will catch the heck of the world. Right? That's what you'll receive. But as we t realize there is a sovereign ruler, he's, he's almighty God, he has very high standards, and no matter what they say in history book, new history books, our founding fathers chose righteousness of the Bible as a guiding light. It's all through the history of our country. Now, the second thing I want you to notice is this. What is the result of righteousness? Look what it says there. It says... Uh, Look back at the text that I read to you at the very beginning there. Righteousness exalts a nation. So what's the natural result of righteousness? It exalts a nation. Now, if you look at our history of our country, there's no doubt that I believe that America has been exalted. Uh, everyone wants to come to America, right? I don't see anybody saying, hey, I want to move to Cuba. I don't see that happening. I want to move over to Iran. I, I don't see it happening, but everybody wants to come to America. Now, some, like Nebuchadnezzar and the book of Daniel, they want to take credit for some, such exaltation. And that mentality that somehow we deserve what we have, uh, the greatness and the power, that's a very sad mistake to make. I would suggest to you that America has been exalted because of its citizens' uh, goodness and personal holiness. I say America's been exalted because of the churches that have been uh, about the Great Commission at home and also abroad, sharing the good news. Now, why is it that the prominence of America has been on the downslide? Why is it that we're losing that, uh, uh, that desire? And uh, what's going on? Why, why are we losing that luster we once have? I suggest to you, it is our lack of righteousness. It's, la it's our lack of a commitment to the gospel truth, the lack of commitment to God's standard of living. And as a result of that, we're reaping what we have sown, and we're losing our prominence. When you think about the word exalt in its context, righteousness exalts a nation. So what is an exalted nation? What would you just say is an exalted nation? I would say uh, to be lifted up or to be made high. I want you to listen to what it says in uh, Psalms 46. We know the first part of this verse. We probably have quoted it many, many times. Be still and know that I'm God. There's another half of that verse. He says, I will be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted among the earth. Then in Psalms uh, 37, verse 34, it says, uh, Hope in the Lord and keep His way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are destroyed, you will see it. Now, those verses, what they teach is that God Himself is exalted. He is exalted. And if we hope and keep our confidence in the Lord, He'll exalt us. But also it says the nation of Israel, as they inherit the land, they'll be exalted. But our text in Proverbs says that righteousness exalts a nation. It's my opinion that there is no nation in the history of the world that's been lifted up like America. We have dominated the scene for the 20th century. So I think that an exalted nature, it is set apart. I also think it's safe. To think about the word exalt, it means to, to raise high to a, like an inaccessible fortress or a, out of the reach of danger. Listen to what it says in Psalms uh, 32, verse 7. It says, you are my hiding place. 
You will protect me from the trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Then in Psalms 119 verse 114 says, You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. Now many nations have been destroyed by the enemies of God or by God himself by maybe natural disasters, plagues, uh, pestilence, war. Unbelief uh, has destroyed many countries. Now, if my adding is correct, that sometimes my adding is flawed, but I believe Tuesday, the birth of our country, will be 247 years old if my adding is correct. And that's by, by the grace of Almighty God. We do not deserve anything, but we have been blessed. Amen? We've been blessed. But also, I think an exalted nation that they're set apart, it's safe, but also it's strong. That means, the, exalt, the word exalt can mean to triumph over our enemies. Now, look at our history. History proves that God's hand of protection has been upon us. Uh, think about all the times of war and then the time of peace. Now, think about the odds. What are the odds of the colonies defeating the most powerful nation in the 18th century, the British Empire? What's the likelihood of that happening? Yet it happened, and we take the Revolutionary War, uh, I guess, for granted, and uh, it's really a miracle from Almighty God. Then you think about uh, a country, I can't imagine a country in its history having a civil war and yet surviving. Yet I think that is the grace and the protection of Almighty God. Then in World War II, you think about that, that war, uh, America took on much of the world essentially single-handedly and assured freedom throughout the globe. And there was a time when we would say, we've never lost a war. I think we must give God credit and give God glory for what He's done. And then in uh, Psalms 144, uh, it says, Praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. So we've seen the, the righteousness of a nation. We've seen the results of that righteousness. Now let's look thirdly at the rot of a nation. God promises to exalt a nation, right? That's what he says. But he also says that sin destroys it. God says so in the very same verse, verse 34. Today I think what happens is we want, um, so many in our country, we want, we want buffet-style Christianity. We want a God who is merciful, a God who is loving, a God who is kind. And certainly our Almighty God feels all of those needs. But He also is a God of mercy, He's a God of, he's a God of judgment, and a God of damnation. He is the same God. And people turn away from such a God. And, but here's a problem. Uh, both sides of this verse are true. God exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach or a, uh, it is a, it's a downfall of, of many. You can't accept one side of the truth and reject the other side. They both are true. Now, sin, let's think about what sin is. It's a reproach. It's a, uh, it condemns many people, it says. Sin, it's missing the mark like an archer shooting an arrow at the target. It misses the target completely. I want you to listen to what it says in Psalms chapter 2. Help, Lord, what sad words, for no one is faithful anymore. Those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. What sad words we read there out of Psalms. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3 that there's none righteous, no, not one. And as we drift from the true standard, uh, we have an undisciplined aim, and we, we're, we, we miss living a life that honors the Almighty, and we, we make excuses. But there are no excuses that are satisfactory at all. Today we live sloppy lives, unrighteous lives, and we're so careless with our choices, with our words and our actions. Missing God's mark is the result of undisciplined aim, living a careless life that we can't please God with. So I think we have things backward in our country today. Uh, in my opinion, God's truth uh, describes it this way. It starts when evil is overlooked. Then evil is permitted. Then sin is legalized. Then it is promoted. Then it's celebrated. And then the, those who call it evil are persecuted. I see that downward spiral breakneck speed in our country. Now, many are content to miss the mark because they say, well, I've got a confidence that I know that, that God is good. And if I stumble and I err from the path, you know, it's all right, it's all right. We have a built-in excuse. Uh, 
everybody's guilty. Everybody does this. They do that. And I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Did you see it? They made the paper. I'm not as bad as they are. They're horrible. We all stumble, right? That's a very careless attitude. I think America has taken the blessings of God, assuming that He will continue to bless and protect us in spite of our sin. I think that's where we are. I want to read to you Psalms 59, verse 12. For the sins of their mouths, for the words of their lips, let them be caught in their pride. For their curses and the lies they utter. Now, so sin's missing the mark as having a foolish confidence. But I also think we sin because we have spiritual amnesia. Think about it for a moment. We forget about what the Lord's done for us. We, we forget about the price that He paid for us. We, we forget about the agony of the cross. We, we forget about what He did to free us from sin. And we have this hazy memory, and as a result of that hazy memory, we condone sin in our lives, we practice it, and we overlook it, and we forget about the standard of God's Word. Daniel chapter 9, it says these words, All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and the sworn judgments written in the law of Moses have been poured out on us. Because we have sinned against you. Then in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, it says, Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. So what's the result of this rot? Uh, the King James uses that word reproach. I like that word, reproach. Uh, it means shame. It means to be condemned. Uh, it means to be disgraced, to be brought low from the heights down to the depths. In Nehemiah chapter 1, uh, we've read that before and studied it before. Nehemiah is in the palace there taking care of. He's the king's cupbearer. He, he's kind of living a life of luxury, if you want to call it that. And uh, he asked about the remnant that's gone back to Jerusalem. And, the, and they, said, they said, well, they're in great affliction. They're a reproach. Their walls are broken down and the gates of the city have been burned. Israel had sinned and it caused them to go into captivity. Now their capital city lies in ruins and the remnant had been brought low by their sin. I think we too have been brought from the heights of where we were to where we are right now presently because of the rot of sin. I think we've missed the mark. I think we as Americans, uh, we think, well, he, he loves us. Well, we know that he loves us. He does. But we have spiritual amnesia about his standards. Thus we've been brought low. You've heard the quote from Billy Graham, haven't you? If God doesn't punish the sin of America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. End quote. No, God's not going to turn a blind eye to folly, our folly, our sin, our whims. As God judged Israel and the heathen nations, He will also judge us. And so the results of uh, that, that rod is being dishonored. And in 1 Samuel, Israel was powerless. Think about the valley there. They're facing uh, Goliath and all the army of Israel is scared. They're, they're hearing this giant call out their name and make fun of God. And they're all hiding and they're, they're kind of creeling back from the, the fear of Goliath. And, and what did David say? He said in 1 Samuel... He said these words, What will be done to the man who kills this Philistine and removes this reproach, this disgrace, this shame? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? And Israel had been brought low. Don't think the same thing can't happen to us. The results of rot are dishonor and defeat. I think the Last final step would be to pluck or strip away all that is good. You know, we all have ideas and opinions. It's my opinion that our country is going downhill at breakneck speed. We're into the gutter and going into the sewer. That's just my opinion. When I think about God's standards and Think about the carelessness in which we oftentimes live. I think, wow. 
And it's easy to think, well, you know, it has nothing to do with really me. It's just the country is doing that, but it's not really me. It has nothing really to do with me or nothing to do with you. It's, just not, it's easy to stand in here and point out there. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. So easy to do that. Remember the story as the children of Israel have been given the promised land. All they had to do was follow the Lord's guidance, and he would fight their battles for them. You know the story of Jericho, and they a great fortified city. I think the walls were like seven foot wide, and they told them some crazy battle plan God gave them, march around it, and finally yell and blow the trumpets, and their walls fall inside. And it happened. I can imagine them walking on cloud nine. Wow, look, look, look what we've done. We, the walls fell inward. And, and, but God said, don't take anything there. It's, it's all mine. So the next battle they came to was a little bitty, little bitty suburb kind of called Ai. Itty bitty town. Just send a few there, not the whole army because it's so small. Don't say it's a mess and get everybody all riled up. Just send a few out there and take care of them. And, and they went, and what happened was AI beat the socks off of them. Some introspection happened there. Joshua began asking the Lord why this happened. And remember the words of the Lord came, there's sin in the camp. See, there was this one guy named Achan. He thought, well, the Lord spoils here and he's not going to miss just a little bit I can take a little bit of the world here I take some of this gold and some of these nice clothes the Lord don't need all that God, look, he's got the whole spoil of Jericho and he's not going to miss this little bit he took the world's standards he took the world's way and took what didn't belong to him and look what happened that one man caused the whole nation to go down to a little bitty place, a little spot on the little spot on the map called Ai. And it would cost an ache in his life, he and his family. So don't say it, don't don't say it's it has nothing to do with me. I think it has a lot to do with all of us. When we tolerate this of the world or that of the world, or we, we embrace this and we take that. Well, God says that, well, this okay, that's that's all right. I, 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 no, it's not all right. When you think about our lives, think about the country that we live in. And I've often said this, a church is only as strong as its weakest link. You've heard that before from my mouth. Could not the same thing be said about our country? Our stand for righteousness, our stand in the public square, our stand for truth, our stand against the ungodly that are coming after our kids. I think we have some catching up to do, do we not? And I think when you think about does God have a message for us today, um, I think He does. I think it was Friday. I don't know if you all read the Daily Bread. We pass them out back in the back, a little devotion book. I, I love it. It's the first thing I read in the morning, very first thing I read. And um, Fridays, I'll read it on my phone. I don't have a hard copy, but I read it on my phone. Fridays uh, was about a man named John Perkins. I never heard of John Perkins. He'd given his life to uh, trying to uh, bring people together, to bring reconciliation. And he had a message as he was dying, and he said these words. Repent is the only way back to God. Unless you repent, you will perish. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? The apostle Peter said, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That sounds familiar too. Uh, what John Perkins said and what Peter said mirror what Jesus said. Jesus said, unless you repent, you too will perish. I think that's God's message to America. We need to repent. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So we're going to sing in a moment, and maybe you'd say, you know, I've embraced, I've been kind of like Achan. I've embraced just a little bit of this or that standard, or I've, 
I need to repent of that. I need to agree with what God has said. I need to confess it before Him. He'll forgive us and cleanse us, and He'll put us in the position where we'll be greatly used for His kingdom. That's what He can do. But we have to repent. If we've taken that accursed thing, that, that way or that practice of the world and embraced it, maybe we've got, we have idols in our lives, God is jealous. He's to be supreme above everything else. If we're going to sing in a moment, Justin's going to lead us. And, but if you're here and you say these words, you know, I, I, I need to repent of this. I, I've got it, this idol. I've, I've grabbed that accursed thing like Achan did, and it's, I need to get rid of it. Give it to God. Give it to Jesus. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us and to forgive us for all unrighteousness. That's what he says. Maybe you say these words, well, I've never been saved. I I, I just don't, I've not, uh, I've never given my heart, never surrendered to Jesus. Today he's given you another chance, opportunity. Or maybe you're saying, like uh, Miss Debbie said last week, I've never followed the, the Lord and believers' baptism. I need to do that. I need to get square that away. Or maybe it's to become a church member. Or maybe, you know, Bible school's approaching. Uh, uh, what are you doing in Bible school? Have a chance to make a difference. So I'm going to pray, and Justin's going to come. We're going to sing. But as God has laid it upon your heart, I'm going to ask you to respond to be obedient. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We uh, thank you for being a God of grace. We thank you for the way in which you have blessed our country, Lord. You have blessed us so, so richly. But Lord, our country is slipping. And it appears at breakneck speed going in the opposite direction of you. Lord, I pray that you would identify those things in our hearts and you would point them out to us even now that we may confess and grieve with what you say and turn away from those things. Lord, I pray for those that aren't Christian that have never been saved today. They would say, yes, today I need Jesus. Or those that would say, yes, today I want to follow and do what he says. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we get to gather and we get to worship and we get to hear and to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.